Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us here in London. Uh, I have with me today uh, Ben Rhodes, the President's uh, Deputy National Security Advisor for Strate uh, Strategic Communications. He will uh, give you a briefing on the state visit so far, as well as uh, an update on events for tomorrow. Uh, before he does that, though, I have a, uh, a statement by the President regarding some news involving uh, Chrysler's full repayment and final repayment of its TARP uh, money today, uh, making a final payment of $5.1 billion. Statement by the President uh, is as follows. Chrysler's repayment of its outstanding loans to the U.S. Treasury and American taxpayers marks a significant milestone for the turnaround of Chrysler and the countless communities and families who rely on the American auto industry. This announcement comes six years ahead of schedule and just two years after emerging from bankruptcy, allowing Chrysler to build on its progress and continue to grow as the economy recovers. Supporting the American auto industry required making some tough decisions, but I was not willing to walk away from the workers at Chrysler and the communities that rely on this iconic American company. I said if Chrysler and all its stakeholders were willing to take the difficult steps necessary to become more competitive, America would stand by them, and we did. While there is more work to be done, we are starting to see stronger sales, additional shifts at plants, and signs of strength in the auto industry and our economy, a true testament to the resolve and determination of American workers across the nation. Uh, that's the end of the President's statement. I would add that since June of 2009, uh, the American auto industry has added 115,000 jobs. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Ben. And then we'll take, depending on the nature of your questions, we'll each take questions. Great. Uh, thanks, Jay. Um, so I just want to, uh, before we take your questions, give you some <clears throat> updates on uh, the visit so far and uh, plans for tomorrow. Um, the President was in very good spirits uh, after his uh, trip to Ireland. Um, had a wonderful uh, day yesterday with the, the people of Ireland and uh, very much enjoyed himself um, in getting to know some of his uh, distant relatives um, and the, the broader Irish public. Um, today, of course, we had a series of events um, with uh, the Queen and the Prime Minister. Um, I think in general, uh, as you saw the President reaffirm in a, an op-ed with Prime Minister Cameron this morning, um, the U.S.-U.K. relationship is um, both essential for our countries and for the world. Um, and th the purpose of this visit uh, is to reaffirm that relationship, um, to further align our approaches uh, on all of the core issues that we work with the United Kingdom on. Uh, and that runs the gamut from uh, our cooperation on global economic recovery uh, to the effort in Afghanistan, counterterrorism, um, our efforts in Libya, um, our nonproliferation agenda, um, and a whole host of issues that the Prime Minister and the President will have the opportunity to discuss tomorrow. Um, I think also the President was very honored to be received by the Queen today. Uh, she, of course, is a, a, a historic figure who in many ways embodies the depth of the ties between our two nations, uh, dating back, of course, to our shared effort um, in World War II and throughout the Cold War. Um, and uh, again, I think her uh, receiving the President was a, a deep honor for both uh, him and the First Lady. Um, and again, underscores um, the friendship between our two countries. Um, the uh, President then, of course, was able to uh, visit with Prime Minister Cameron um, and to visit a, a local school in town. Uh, the President and Prime Minister Cameron both very much wanted to have the opportunity within the context of uh, the formal state visit um, to get out and interact with um, some young people, um, and uh, they were able to do so uh, at the Globe Academy. Um, and again, I think uh, it, was, it spoke to the President's desire to, uh, again, interact with uh, some of the British people during his, his time here in addition to his official uh, business. Um, just a couple of scheduling things uh, to run through. Um, tonight, uh, of course, is the uh, dinner at Buckingham Palace. Tomorrow, uh, the President will have a bilateral meeting with uh, Prime Minister Cameron. Um, I went through some of the subjects that they'll be um, discussing. Uh, after that, uh, they'll drop by a barbecue that's being hosted. Uh, by the First Lady and Prime Minister Cameron's wife um, to celebrate uh, military families. Um, and um, uh, this will have service members from the United States who are based in the UK, as well as, um, uh, of course, British uh, service members. They'll be announcing a new joint uh, initiative uh, focused on uh, military families. And 
um, uh, care for our veterans. Uh, this, of course, has been a focus for the First Lady in the United States. It's also a focus for Prime Minister Cameron and his wife here. Um, and uh, this will establish a new service personnel task force um, that will share best practices on how we can better uh, provide um, support for military uh, personnel and their families. Uh, that includes um, linking them up uh, uh, in their communities uh, with the, uh, uh, to meet their needs. Uh, that includes supporting uh, the transition of those who are leaving services uh, into civilian life through vocational training and education. Uh, it includes support for wounded uh, warriors and, and other uh, ill and injured personnel, uh, including the uh, physical and psychological care and rehabilitation that they need. Um, and it speaks to the fact that we're coming through a period of a time where we've had, um, of course, nearly 10 years of conflict. Uh, so many of the same challenges that we have in the United States associated with wounded warriors and military families um, are, uh, are present here in the UK. So what this task force will do is bring together experts from both countries on a regular basis, um, seek the views and involvement of uh, charitable organizations and the private sector, um, and, and bring together, again, government officials who can, on a regular basis, share those best practices um, and help um, strengthen uh, our efforts to support uh, service members and their families. So after that uh, event, uh, the President and Prime Minister will hold uh, a joint uh, press conference. Uh, then the President will um, address the uh, British Parliament. Uh, again, it's an, uh, uh, an honor that he's um, very uh, deeply moved to receive. I'll, I'll just say a few things about the speech, and, and you may have questions on it. Um, I think what he'll again underscore um, is both the essential nature of the U.S.-U.K. alliance um, as well as the broader transatlantic alliance um, to global security uh, and prosperity. Um, I think he'll speak to the fact that um, we've obviously come through a very difficult decade, um, but in some respects uh, we're turning a, a corner uh, insofar as we've, um, we've successfully ended our combat mission in Iraq, removed 100,000 troops. The British forces, of course, have left Iraq. Um, our efforts uh, to dismantle, defeat, uh, disrupt and defeat al-Qaeda uh, have weakened that organization, of, of course, including the uh, killing of Osama bin Laden recently. Uh, we're preparing to begin a, a transition, or have already begun a transition uh, in Afghanistan to Afghan lead uh, that we'll continue to undertake uh, over the course uh, of the next, um, until 2014. Um, and of course, we are working very hard every day uh, to advance a global economic recovery. Um, in that context, of course, um, we recognize that uh, we live in a new world that's quite different from uh, the one that we faced after World War II or the end of the Cold War. Um, you have, of course, rising uh, powers around the world. Um, and I think uh, what the President will reaffirm, though, is that um, even in that changing context, um, that it is the, uh, the alliance between the United States and the United Kingdom and the broader transatlantic alliance um, that is uh, the cornerstone uh, of global security um, and the extension of the democratic values that uh, we, we share. Um, the United States and United Kingdom, along with our allies, are the ones who shoulder um, uh, particular burdens for global security. We see that in Afghanistan. Uh, we see that in our efforts against al-Qaeda. We see that, of course, today in Libya. Uh, we uh, are deeply invested in uh, an international system that marshals collective action um, and that can be applied, uh, of course, to um, not just our efforts in Afghanistan, but our efforts around nonproliferation, um, the, uh, the, the effort, ongoing effort to enforce um, uh, sanctions on nations like Iran and North Korea that are not meeting their uh, obligations. Um, we, we see that, of course, in our efforts to promote development uh, around the world, uh, to combat disease um, uh, together. Uh, but ab above all, we see that in the set of values that um, that we share, democratic values. And um, again, at a time when we see people um, in the Middle East and North Africa, in particular, reaching for those democratic values, um, it underscores that uh, the things that we believe in um, uh, are, are not just relevant, um, but essential to uh, the, de the development of greater um, prosperity and security and uh, democracy for peoples around the, the world. So he'll speak about uh, steps that we can take to support um, universal rights in the Middle East and, and North Africa. Um, so that's a, a, a brief preview. I think he'll, it'll be a broad lay of the land about, um, again, uh, our economic efforts, um, our efforts on behalf of global security and our values, um, as well as um, 
what, uh, what it is exactly that binds uh, the U.S. and the U.K. together. Um, after that, of course, uh, then the President will later on that night uh, ho host a, uh, uh, a dinner for the Queen to reciprocate for her hospital <coughs> hospitality. Um, then the only other thing I'd mention at the top of this is, uh, uh, as, as you know, I think the President signed an executive order associated with our Iran sanctions efforts last night. Uh, and today, uh, there was an announcement of the designation of uh, a number of additional um, companies uh, in the nonproliferation and energy sectors um, uh, associated with our Iran sanctions effort. Um, I guess this, this continues to reinforce uh, the message that we've sent, which is um, that uh, there's going to be a cost to doing business with Iran, uh, that Iran is increasingly isolated and paying a price uh, for its uh, illicit nuclear program. Um, and it, it frankly comes on the heels of a very robust set of European Union sanctions that were announced in recent days, uh, I think which further underscores the point that the U.S. and Europe are working in concert uh, to advance uh, the agenda of nonproliferation and the agenda of uh, peace and security more broadly. So with that, we'd be uh, happy to take your questions. Julie. Thank you. I actually have a slide more for Ben. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the discussion tomorrow between Cameron and Obama on Libya. Uh, a lot of the talk that we hear now is sort of forward-looking, you know, what happens after Gaddafi leaves power. But, you know, he's still there. He's still in power. So what is the discussion going to focus on in terms of the next steps in the NATO mission? Um, and then also there are some British politicians that have criticized the U.S. and asked for more U.S. involvement in the NATO mission. Is that something the U.S. is open to, or is what we're doing now the extent of what we are going to do? Yeah, I, I'd say a number of things. Um, Libya will certainly be one of the lead agenda items tomorrow. Um, uh, first of all, I think it's important to understand the current context, which is that um, I think we believe that the trends show um, that time is very much working against Gaddafi. Um, since we began the operation uh, just over two months ago, um, we've significantly degraded his forces. Uh, we've enabled the enforcement of no-fly zone. And not only have we stopped his advance on major population centers like Benghazi, uh, where there could have been a massacre, um, but you've actually seen the opposition take uh, the time and space that it needs to organize. Um, to push um, Qaddafi's forces back from Misrata, um, to push them back not just from Benghazi but Ajabiya. Um, so uh, we believe that uh, Qaddafi and his forces are under tremendous strain. I think you saw today there were uh, additional targeting um, in Tripoli um, at command and control centers, um, all of which I think uh, sends a message that, um, that the trend lines are against Qaddafi, that time is working against him. Um, I think tomorrow in their discussions they'll talk about uh, again, the need to sustain that kind of uh, pressure uh, through the NATO mission, uh, along with our coalition partners. They'll also talk about ways that we can support the opposition. Um, we have recently have received in Washington uh, members of the council um, who we believe are a credible interlocutor, a legitimate interlocutor of the Libyan people. We're providing assistance to them, uh, non-lethal assistance, um, in line with uh, a number of other nations. Um, and so one of the things that we can do over time is um, again, build their capacity to, to deliver on behalf of the Libyan people. Um, and lastly, they'll talk about the international uh, alignment uh, and the international effort that's necessary to support Libya, not just through our military action, um, but the political and diplomatic support as well. There's a contact group that's met several times um, to discuss um, both the military effort that's ongoing, but also the humanitarian assistance that can be provided, the political support uh, for the opposition in Libya, and ultimately, uh, what kind of transition um, could take place in Libya um, when, uh, when Qaddafi um, is, is no longer in power? Um, and in that effort, uh, the Council has made a number of positive statements about moving towards a democratic and inclusive uh, Libya. So I think they'll talk about that as well. And on your, your second question, I think you know, the United States provided an enormous amount of resources on the front end of the military effort to, uh, to stop Qaddafi's forces in their tracks. Um, and to degrade his um, capabilities so a no-fly zone could be more easily enforced. We always said that we would then transition to a NATO command um, and that our, our partners would take on a lot of the responsibility for um, the no-fly zone and striking targets on the ground. But we've continued to provide um, a, a range of assistance to that effort, logistical support, um, intelligence support, targeting support, uh, jamming of Libyan communications. Um, and in addition to that, uh, uh, we identified a unique capability that we thought could help um, with the effort, which was our, uh, the, the ability to target, um, uh, to, to hit targets with a, 
uh, unmanned aerial vehicle, uh, for instance, um, which allows for precision targeting. Um, and uh, again, we also think it's important to look at the, the broad picture. Uh, you have the striking of targets on the ground, but you also have the need um, to enforce uh, an arms embargo, to enforce sanctions. Um, and so we're looking at ways to both do that and to get more resources to the opposition. And there's an ongoing effort on the Hill right now to look at how we might be able to vest some of the funds from uh, the, the money that we see from Qaddafi and the opposition. So there's a lot of ways that the U.S. is contributing um, diplomatically um, through support to the opposition and through support to the military effort. And we're satisfied that, um, that we'll continue to, uh, to do so and that that is playing an incredibly important um, role in the operation. Yep. Considering sending attack helicopters to Libya, is this something you, that you support? And is it a sign that the war is dragging on sort of indecisively? Well, uh, first of all, I, I, I don't think it's a sign because, uh, as I said, in just two months, um, we've not only accomplished the initial objective, which is stopping a massacre in Benghazi um, and, and putting in place a no-fly zone, um, but you've seen uh, all of the trends running against Gaddafi. Uh, again, whether it's um, the opposition's taking control of Misrata uh, and Ajabiya, um, whether it's um, his, his being cut off from the cash and arms that he needs to resupply and the degradation of his forces. Um, so there's, a, again, a steady erosion of Qaddafi's uh, ability to uh, endanger his own citizens uh, that we believe um, it, you know, demonstrates that time is going to work against him. With regard to the helicopters, um, what we said at the outset is that um, there's an international effort under NATO command, um, along with Arab participation, which is, uh, again, unique in the history of NATO to have Arab participation under a NATO-led effort. Each nation will make individual decisions about the nature of its contrib contributions. Um, so you've had nations, for instance, that have um, flown missions and hit targets on the ground. You have nations who have enforced a no-fly zone. You have nations who are providing um, more uh, support of more of a logistical nature. Uh, but we welcome the contributions of every member of the coalition. So this additional contribution by the British, of course, uh, is an important effort to strengthen uh, the capability of the coalition, and we certainly welcome it. Um, and again, it's in line with um, uh, how the, the operation was set up, which is that um, you have a unified NATO command, and then you have um, coalition members uh, who make their own determinations about their contributions. And, um, but how can the U.S. continue to support the war without having Congress now the 60 days have expired late last week. How can you continue to participate in a war without Congress approving a resolution to say the U.S. can still participate? Well, I, I, Ed, I think we addressed that um, through the letter that uh, the President sent um, uh, up to Congress at the end of last week, uh, again, reaffirming our ongoing efforts in Libya um, and expressing support for um, a resolution uh, that is uh, currently being worked in the Senate uh, by Senator uh, by a number of senators, including, um, for instance, Senator McCain, Senator Kerry, and others. Um, so we believe we have the authorities we need. We believe we have the obligation to continue to consult with Congress uh, on this issue. And we, again, expressed our support for the resolution that is uh, being worked in the Senate. If you want to get Congress to support, why didn't you get it before the 60 days expired? I don't understand how you continue to do it if you don't have the approval you say you're yeah. going to see. It's Congress's decision uh, as to when, uh, whether and when they um, take up a resolution. Um, so uh, again, that's, uh, uh, Congress will determine the timing of, um, uh, of when it might consider a, uh, a resolution. What we've, done in our, what we've done is consistently consult with Congress um, through testimony and other means. Uh, and again, in the, in the letter from the President, we've expressed support for uh, the particular resolution that was um, brought to our attention. Yeah. The, the resolution, uh, I'm sorry, um, the letter uh, in which the resolution is mentioned suggests that the role is limited, the U.S. role is limited so that congressional authorization is not needed. Are you expecting to hear uh, from the French in the next stop and also tomorrow with Prime Minister Cameron uh, a much harder sell for the U.S. to increase uh, the mission back to providing the unique capabilities uh, that the President talked about two months ago? Um, I think that uh, the President, um, before the operation began, um, spoke to both uh, President Sarkozy and Prime Minister Cameron, uh, and he laid out to them um, exactly what he laid out to the American people, uh, which is that we supported the operation and the effort. We helped uh, frankly, mobilize support for it at the United Nations and shape that resolution, um, and that we would provide a commitment 
a substantial commitment of military resources on the front end um, to, again, take immediate action to stop Gaddafi's forces on the ground, because we had a, a unique capability to do that. Um, and that we could similarly uh, degrade his air defenses and other assets in a way that would make it easier for our allies and partners to uh, then enforce a no-fly zone. We, he said at the time, though, to both uh, President Sarkozy and Prime Minister Cameron that um, the nature of that commitment would be limited in scope and duration, um, and that we would hand over command from the United States to NATO, uh, and that we would similarly um, hand over responsibility for um, the uh, enforcement of the civilian protection mission in the no-fly zone to our, to our partners. So that was the understanding from the beginning. Um, what we said since then is that we, uh, uh, again, we would uh, consult with NATO, uh, consider requests, um, but that the nature of our commitment was always going to be um, limited in scope and duration. Um, I, I will say, however, that um, the contributions we're making now um, are very significant to the mission. Um, we do have a unique cap capability, for instance, uh, around uh, our intelligence, around our refueling capacity, around our ability to jam uh, Libyan uh, command, uh, command and control, for instance. Um, so the things that we're doing in support of the mission uh, continue to be very important uh, to its success. Um, and again, we believe that that's totally in line with um, uh, the understandings that we've had with our allies throughout this effort. Um, and what these conversations are, um, are an opportunity to continue to make sure that we're aligned, uh, to continue to make sure that there's um, broad support for the mission, um, and to continue to talk through some of these other issues, which are very important, around how do we get support to the, the opposition, how do we make sure that the international community is preparing um, to support uh, a, perhaps a, a transition uh, to a post-Gaddafi Libya. Um, so there's a whole host of issues associated with Libya that uh, the leaders will be discussing. Um, you talked about the alliance, transatlantic alliance being a, a catalyst for global action. Is that, uh, is it credible that Europe, given its declining defense budgets and declining in, you know, declining in relative power to other areas of the world, could play the role the United States would like it to play? I think in the first instance, um, it's essential that the U.S. and Europe continue to serve as that catalyst for global action. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk um, about uh, other emerging powers, and that talk, uh, you know, leads to questions as to whether or not the United States and Europe are going to continue to play the role in the world that they have um, for several decades uh, as world leaders. Um, but I think if you look at it, uh, there is no other uh, alliance that uh, assumes the, the burdens that we assume on behalf of peace and security. Um, and that, again, uh, invests as much as we do uh, in the enforcement of international law uh, and in global development. Um, and uh, I think the message to Europe, is, and, and frankly, in answer to your question, I think uh, we've been very pleased with the contributions, um, just to take the security side of things, um, that we've seen uh, out of our European allies uh, to the mission in Afghanistan. We've had a dramatic increase. Uh, and resources um, after a period of under-resourcing um, over the last two years. Um, and I think Libya uh, also speaks to the fact that um, our, our European allies um, are accepting uh, uh, a, a burden uh, on behalf of uh, the enforcement of uh, UN Security Council resolutions um, and in terms of uh, trying to, um, again, not just stop a massacre, but um, give the Libyan uh, people an opportunity um, to, to determine their future. So uh, our focus is on maintaining um, the, the role that the U.S. and Europe play together as catalysts for action. Um, and we believe that in the emerging context um, of, of the 21st century, um, not only is that as relevant as ever, um, but it's going to demand um, you know, contributions from, from all nations. Um, and just to take one example in that respect, at, at Lisbon, the NATO agreed on a new strategic concept where um, and different nations would develop different capabilities that could be brought to bear um, so that NATO is no longer uh, an alliance built to uh, simply repel a, a Soviet invasion but um, can meet new, new threats, um, whether they come from ballistic missiles or um, cyber attacks uh, or, um, or terrorism. So uh, we, all of us, frankly, need to be reorienting our capabilities, and we're confident that that's already taking place. Um, through efforts such as um, NATO's uh, adoption of a new strategic concept. Do you have concerns that the, as Europe and the UK in, in particular grapples with a global economic recovery and makes cuts, 
that that, in the words of, of uh, former Under Secretary of State uh, uh, Nick Burns, makes them perhaps a less capable military partner. Uh, this talk of, 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 of mothballing the aircraft carrier, the, their one aircraft carrier, of, 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 of uh, mothballing their Harrier jet fleets. Given the, the essential nature of the relationship, do you have concerns that the economic recovery could make them a less capable partner? Yeah. Um, you know, I'd, I'd just say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I think uh, uh, all nations, of course, are focused on their economic recovery. Um, that's certainly true in the United States, um, and it's certainly true here. Um, we also know that um, uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of nations are uh, looking at ways to uh, reduce spending. Um, the, United, the United States is looking at a range of ways, including in our defense budget. Um, but we believe that we can pursue um, that effort in a way that's entirely consistent with our security needs. Um, and, and that's part of the reason why it's so important uh, to focus on uh, developing the capabilities that are going to be necessary um, to the threats that we face. Um, and they're, you know, because they've changed. Uh, part of what you have is uh, nations whose uh, models of defense spending and habits of defense spending over uh, a period of time, again, were focused on 20th century challenges. Uh, and now what we see is uh, we're more likely to be faced with threats um, from very different places, um, whether it's ballistic missiles uh, or whether it's um, piracy on the high seas, whether it's uh, cyber. Um, so what we want is uh, the, uh, the alliance um, to be able to modernize um, and to make sure that the investments that we're, we're using are, are smart and are focused in the right place. Um, and that we do that on a coordinated basis. Because um, what NATO provides is it provides a, a framework for countries um, to make decisions so that their, uh, their spending and their investments are amplified um, because there are different capabilities that are going to be vested in different places um, against uh, the, the, the challenges that, that we see. Um, so we, we think we're, we're, we're confident uh, that uh, Europe can continue to play uh, the role it's played as our principal uh, and fundamental uh, security partner in the world. Um, you know, even as, of course, we have a number of very critical security relationships, um, you know, ranging from, obviously, our Asian allies to Australia to, to other countries. On the Iran sanctions, thank you. On the Iran sanctions, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the unique aspects of that. Uh, the first time that this has been, uh, the guy say, to go out to the bond and control the products, too. And also, given that uh, one of the companies targeted is a Venezuelan state-owned company, is there a message in this for the government? Yeah, I think there's a, a message that um, there's, two, there's a message to the government of Iran that there's going to be an increasing cost uh, to its failure to live up to its obligations. Uh, what we said uh, from the beginning of our time in office was if Iran couldn't demonstrate the peaceful nature of its program, we were going to grad, uh, we're going to increasingly ramp up uh, the pressure that they face. The Security Council resolution provided a baseline for that. Um, the national actions that we passed through our Congress uh, provided a baseline from that. And the authorities uh, of previous sanctions um, uh, laws uh, provide a basis for that. And what we've done since uh, June of last year is steadily amp up the pressure. Now, I think you know, you're right to identify the fact that uh, the energy sector um, is, is, is one that, that we're focused on. Um, and, it, and it's a message to Iran that we're going to target uh, those places uh, where we believe, uh, again, it's in violation of its, uh, uh, of, of its obligations and where there will be a cost imposed upon them uh, for their actions. Um, so the message to the Iranian government is we're, we're going to be stepping up the pressure. It's not going to pause. It's not going to let up. Uh, and we're going to be continually, look, continually looking for ways um, to tighten the screws. In terms of the, uh, the companies involved, um, there's a very clear message that there's a cost of doing business uh, with Iran, uh, that essentially there's a choice in many respects between doing business with us and doing business with Iran. Um, and, and so that, therefore, uh, we're going to uh, disincentivize um, uh, those companies that engage in, in, in business with Iran. And you know, what you've seen in the course of the last year is uh, a number of, of, of major companies make their own determinations um, that they would rather stop doing business with Iran than, uh, than continue to do so in the current uh, climate where they're facing these sanctions and they're under these pressures. Um, so that, that expands across the board to everybody that we sanctioned, including the uh, uh, company you mentioned. Just to be clear, so you're saying the message is more for the business community as opposed to, in Venezuela's case, the government itself? Well, I think it's to everybody who does business with Iran. You know, I, I think uh, 
Um, and, and again, uh, that, that, that that's not a safe, uh, that's not the right place um, uh, to be investing, that the international community uh, has a program of sanctions uh, and that we're gonna be um, tightening those sanctions uh, and that, that business is better off done elsewhere. Um, and that's a big part of the isolation that Iran's gonna face and it's a big part of the costs that they're gonna continue to face if they don't meet their obligations. When it comes to the Eurozone debt issues, how much did that play into the conversations the President had yesterday, played into today, and Jay, this may be for you, uh, and does the President think that while he's here that the Euro debt problems are, at the very least for the short term, contained? That, that our debt problems are contained? Uh, well, I, I think we both could take this, but, but we're I'm sure that is part of the discussions, uh, obviously uh, economic uh, 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 issues are, are on the table for the meetings, uh, both here and at the G8, uh, and uh, we, we monitor what's happening in Europe very closely, as you know, as we have uh, uh, since uh, we came to office. Um, but I don't want to characterize uh, the efforts that are being made uh, one way or the other, but we obviously are discussing with them um, the need to get debts under control, get deficits under control, just like uh, we're endeavoring to do in the United States. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I just add that from the, throughout uh, these issues, um, President Obama, Secretary Geithner, and others uh, consult regularly with their European counterparts on this. Uh, we, of course, did throughout the situation in Greece last year. Um, so I, I, I fully expect that, um, you know, as a part of our uh, global economic recovery agenda, they'll be discussing uh, these issues in the coming days. Hey, Ben, so uh, in a speech before this joint meeting of Congress, Prime Minister Netanyahu referred to Hamas as the Palestinian version of al-Qaeda. Uh, does the U.S. government share that assessment? And if not, is this rhetoric that helps the peace process or not? Well, the, the U.S. Uh, very clearly believes that Hamas is a terrorist organization, that, um, that until um, it ceases its use of terrorism, uh, it's, and recognizes Israel's right to exist, uh, that they can't be a credible partner for peace. The President made that uh, very clear in his speech on Thursday, um, that the Palestinian leadership is going to have to provide some credible answers to Israel about how it can uh, be a partner for peace, um, and that those answers are going to have to include, uh, of course, recognizing its right to exist. Um, so we, we do share an assessment, and have for, for some time, uh, that Hamas is a terrorist uh, organization, unlike all... Well, you know, those, those are Prime Minister Netanyahu's words. It's, the comparison that's fair is that Hamas has in the, in the past um, indiscriminately targeted uh, innocent uh, women and children and men um, through the firing of rockets or uh, through uh, bombs on buses. So um, uh, we certainly, uh, you know, they sh certainly share the characteristics of a terrorist organization that um, uh, uh, has uh, indiscriminately taken civilian life. Any overall response to the speech? Um, you know, again, I think uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu um, reaffirmed uh, the strength of the, the U.S.-Israeli relationship. Um, he uh, laid out um, his, uh, his deep concerns about Iran, uh, which we certainly share, and um, uh, again, have, have taken additional action in the last couple of days around our sanctions effort. Um, and again, uh, pointed to the importance of, of peace. Uh, we had, uh, again, the message he delivered to Congress, I think, is very similar. Um, uh, to the discussions he had with the President and the speech he gave last night. Um, and what we'll continue to do is uh, reaffirm uh, uh, our shared goal, which he, the Prime Minister referenced today, um, that a two-state solution is in the interests uh, of all the parties and that we have to uh, redouble our efforts to pursue that. One more quick question. It looks like the Senate is not going to vote on that resolution on Libya before the Memorial Day recess. Or is the White House disappointed in that? Um, you know, we, again, these determinations are up to Congress. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we defer to them on, on what they decide to take up. Memorial Day? We, we don't have a, uh, you know, we're, we, we don't have a, a timeline that we're um, pursuing with regard to the resolution. We, uh, we've expressed our support for the resolution, um, and it's uh, Congress's determination about when to have that kind of vote. Ben, um, does the President view the formula he laid out last week um, about 67 borders with swaps as a disincentive for Europeans that are thinking about whether to support a Palestinian drive for statehood? Um, does he think that's a, a good counter-argument to say stick with the process, 
um, don't don't allow this snowball to go to roll down the hill. And if so, has he begun articulating that to Prime Minister Cameron? Do you think he will tomorrow? Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I just say a number of things, Mark. Um, first of all, the president doesn't think that um, that you know, that statehood can be achieved through the United Nations. Um, that uh, any kind of unilateral effort to pursue um, statehood uh, is not going to succeed because ultimately these issues have to be negotiated be and agreed upon between Israelis and Palestinians. Um, so he's been very clear with uh, respect to um, uh, prospective efforts in September and the fact that they uh, won't achieve the ultimate goal, which is, of course, a Palestinian state next to a, a secure Israel. We do believe um, that it's important, uh, however, um, to make sure that uh, there is uh, a credible um, alternative to the, those efforts. Um, and again, we believe that that alternative needs to be negotiations between the parties. And what the President was doing on Thursday and then reiterating um, in his APEC speech over the weekend um, is that we believe that there can be a more um, successful foundation for those negotiations if we begin um, w uh, with discussions on the basis of uh, on security and territory, on the basis of uh, 1967 lines of mutually agreed upon swaps for territory, uh, and the assurances that are necessary around Israeli security that uh, by starting there uh, around a, a set of ideas, by the way, that have been discussed at length over the course of the last uh, decade or more um, among the parties, uh, you can show that there's a, uh, a, a foundation for progress um, that didn't previously uh, uh, exist in the public realm, uh, and that that, again, is a credible alternative to um, efforts that uh, we don't think uh, can and will succeed, uh, such as the pursuit of, of unilateral, uh, some kind of unilateral effort to pursue statehood whether at the United Nations or in other places. So it'll certainly be a topic of discussion uh, tomorrow and I'm sure with other leaders. Have you gotten any early feedback from either the Prime Minister or other European leaders? Well, I, th I think uh, absolutely because uh, there was a very strong statement from the Quartet um, uh, the day after the President's speech, um, welcoming it, expressing strong support um, for what he laid out as a basis for negotiation. So we had a very good response from our European allies um, uh, the day after the speech. Um, and I think the, uh, certainly uh, the President and Prime Minister made uh, reference to it in their op-ed this morning and um, uh, we expect that, uh, uh, again, we, we want to marshal international support um, for uh, negotiations and for uh, the basis of negotiations that uh, um, the President laid out. Can you explain the goals of the National Security Task Force that you mentioned forming and are there going to be other sorts of things like that? that the U.K. and the U.S. announced tomorrow? Yeah. I think that what we've seen since we came into office is um, that on the, the core issues that we are focused on every day at the National Security Council, um, on, on just about every single one, uh, the United Kingdom is a partner with us. Um, and that uh, that requires very close coordination. Um, when you talk about implementing a transition in Afghanistan, when you talk about our counterterrorism um, efforts, when you talk about uh, the nonproliferation agenda that I, d I, d I discussed. Um, and so in order to better enable that coordination, um, we've decided to formalize um, the process by which we consult and coordinate with the, the UK so that you have you know, regular established contacts um, between the senior members of, of our team and uh, our senior uh, British counterparts um, so that our approaches are aligned um, so that we can share uh, ideas and information uh, and so that we can speak about uh, what efforts we might carry back to, to other countries as well. Um, so I think it's, a, it's an effort to formalize consultation, to make sure it's on a regular basis, to make sure that the lines of communication um, are constantly open between us. It speaks to the uniqueness of the relationship that we have with the United Kingdom, um, that we would uh, coordinate with them um, at this level. Um, and, and these types of mechanisms um, prove uh, quite useful. Uh, you know, for instance, we have a, a, a separate one um, with our quad partners, uh, Germany, uh, France, the UK, and the United States, um, where you know, Tom Donnellan regularly has um, a secure video conference with his national security advisor counterparts. Uh, and of course, the president speaks um, uh, on, a, on a fairly regular basis um, with, with each of those three in a, in a quad setting. Um, so uh, again, we believe it's a signal of the depth of the relationship and will allow us to make sure that we're uh, totally uh, synced up as we uh, deal with some very big pieces of business in the next year or two. Are there yeah. Other cool. okay. Are there other one things like that, similar things, initiatives that you're going to Yeah, well, I, um, 
the, the military families one that I, I spoke to is, uh, um, is a manifestation of that. There'll be a designated lead official from both of our governments, um, again, to meet on a regular basis to marshal um, private sector and charitable support for military families and wounded warriors. Um, uh, so it, uh, it's the kind of thing we do in different sectors, um, and uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll continue to pursue that in the economic and security realm. Do a couple more. Yeah. Is there, um, is it the president's hope, is it the delegation's hope that you will come out of tomorrow and the G8 with something on Libya that will sort of show that you're trying to end this sooner rather than later and that everyone is going to put in more of an effort than they have or various parties are going to put in more of an effort than they have so far? And, and if that's the case, how would that correspond to the um, Security Council resolution? Well, um, I think that You've seen um, already uh, a, a very robust um, pace of targeting and operations uh, in recent days, uh, including in, in Tripoli, uh, command and control targets. Um, and I think that that sends a very clear message that um, the pressure is not going to relent, uh, uh, that it's actually going to um, increase. Um, and uh, I think we want to underscore uh, to Gaddafi that, uh, that the uh, the foot is not going to come off the gas pedal in terms of um, the decisions he's going to have to make because NATO is going to continue our efforts with the passage of time. The opposition uh, has more time and space. Um, so I think it's a set of messages, uh, all of which convey to Gaddafi that uh, uh, leaving is, um, is, uh, is in his best interest and the best interest of the Li Libyan people. Um, again, around the military effort, the civilian support for the opposition and the international community's support for uh, Libya's future. And I think it's entirely in line with the UN Security Council resolution. Uh, all of the targets we're hitting are in, are in line with the mission of civilian protection um, and taking all necessary measures to achieve that goal, uh, whether it's striking targets on the ground, disabling air assets, or disabling uh, command and control targets. I should just add, just since, since you mentioned the G8, uh, you know, it is important, uh, I think, to underscore how much the Middle East and North Africa and the democratic transitions there will be an agenda item uh, both tomorrow and at the G8. Um, one of the, I think, big topics of discussion that the President and Prime Minister will have tomorrow is a change in the, in the region. Um, the support we can provide to Egypt and Tunisia, for instance, um, as potential democratic models as they go through their transitions. Uh, and then that will be reaffirmed at the G8. We've been in touch with our G8 partners, and they've been in touch with us, uh, about precisely the kinds of ideas the President referenced in his speech around um, international support, uh, around some of the uh, reorientation of institutional support um, to the Middle East and North Africa. So I think um, both in tomorrow's meetings and uh, in Deauville, um, you'll see Egypt and Tunisia as a topic of conversation and uh, the region more generally. Uh, yes, Scott. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, some Europeans have, have said they're not inclined to support the statehood resolution, Palestinian statehood resolution, but if no peace process has begun by September, they'd have a hard time telling Palestinian leadership that they, that they uh, won't support it. Would the president reconsider his position if no peace process has begun by September? And what will his response to that uh, be in the meetings with some of yeah. his leaders in the next couple of days? Well, we certainly don't believe that the UN is the appropriate forum for um, uh, achieving Palestinian statehood. So that, um, that is the US position will continue to be. Um, I think one of the things uh, that's important, though, around a peace process is, um, first of all, you have to make sure you have a credible partner on both sides. And um, I think, you know, our European uh, allies um, uh, have, uh, have, of course, um, similar questions uh, about the best way to get the process going. And we believe that getting the process going is going to require a credible answer from the Palestinians about the role that Hamas is going to play in the new government uh, and whether a Palestinian partner and interlocutor um, can uh, credibly say it recognizes Israel's right to exist and is not uh, committed to engaging in terrorism. So in the first instance, there is some, uh, again, some step that needs to be taken on the Palestinian side, um, again, to give Israel that confidence to come to negotiation. Uh, and in the second uh, instance, uh, we do believe, though, to uh, catalyze the process and to, um, again, give uh, an affirmation that we believe it can succeed. Um, it, was, uh, it was our position to, that putting out U.S. principles, U.S. Uh, positions uh, on the fundamental issues of territory and security uh, provide that basis for negotiations. So again, all of that is a part of investing in uh, a credible alternative um, uh, to uh, what we believe are um, efforts that won't uh, succeed in resolving the conflict. I have to let Ben go. We'll just take one more for Ben, if you want. 
Um, uh, yeah. So with markets down in Europe, is the economy going to become an even bigger part of the discussions? It seemed like North Africa and the Middle East were going to be the central theme last week in the briefing. Is, is the economy going to become a bigger part? And then also, is the President going to express support for Britain's um, austerity measures at the Parliament tomorrow? Um, I, I, I think you know, the economy is always an issue on the agenda. Um, and uh, we're always um, consulting about um, the respective situations in the Eurozone and, and the United States um, that uh, we've learned, frankly, through the G20 process uh, that coordinating our efforts um, is essential to sustaining a global uh, recovery. Um, you know, I, so I think the economy will be uh, certainly a first order of business um, along with a pretty broad peace and uh, security agenda. Um, you know, as I've discussed, Libya, Afghanistan, Iran, um, and other issues, uh, as well as, of course, the Arab Spring. Um, so I think the economy looked at in that context. In terms of the austerity plan, you know, I, I think what we see is that um, both of our nations um, have a strong commitment to sustaining a strong economic recovery and a, a strong commitment to uh, reducing deficits. Um, you know, and that's the position of the U.S. government. That's the position of uh, the British government. Um, and I think uh, what we're focused on is staking out uh, the goals that we're both trying to achieve, which is a global economy that is uh, able to have balanced and sustainable growth. Um, so I think the President will talk about it in that, that broader context of uh, the place that we're trying to get to, both as partners, but uh, also as a, as, a global, um, as a global effort through the G20 and other, and other measures. You think you can go a lot farther than, than the President is willing to go in the U.S. as far as their austerity measures? Well, I think, you know, again, every country um, pursues these, uh, these challenges based upon their own uh, decisions. And the President's, you know, um, may defer to Jay here, the President's laid out his, uh, his approach to deficit reduction, so has Prime Minister Cameron. Um, we share a goal um, uh, within our, each of our countries of, of reducing our deficits. We're obviously uh, very confident in, in, in our approach. Um, but again, in the global context, um, we believe that uh, we need to focus our efforts um, in ensuring that the economic recovery is sustained, that it's balanced. Um, and so that's the nature of, of, uh, of our discussions. Okay. We're going to have to wrap it up. Uh, if, if Ben's going to have to go. I can, I'll, I'll take uh, Ann. Uh, is the President expressed any frustration that he's so far away from home during the destructive, destructive storms in Missouri and other locations, another storm front coming through there tonight? Any discussion of him possibly going home early? Well, I don't have any scheduling updates for you, Ann. I can tell you that the President's very concerned, as uh, he noted this morning and expressed this morning, about the devastating damage uh, caused by these terrible tornadoes. He has spoken twice now with Governor Nixon. He has spoken with uh, FEMA Administrator Craig Fugate, as well as his deputy, uh, and is uh, being updated regularly about the situation on the ground there. Uh, and. Uh, as you know, announced this morning that he'll be traveling to Missouri on Sunday to, to view the damage, consult with uh, officials there on the response and uh, recovery efforts, as well as meet with families. Any concern about the ash cloud maybe complicating any of his travels here in Europe later in the week? We're monitoring that. Again, we don't have any scheduling announcements to make. Uh, we remain on schedule uh, as planned, uh, but we'll obviously uh, apprise you if anything changes. Let me just take one more. I'm going to have to go, too. Let me get, uh, in honor of our special essential relationship, Giles. Yes, it is. In his speech tomorrow, will the President go any further than he did on Thursday on economic assistance that the U.S. and the U.K. and allies together can offer to Egypt, Tunisia, and other struggling democracies, and separately on defense? Will there be any specific mes uh, message from the President to the Prime Minister about where the U.S. thinks British defense spending levels should be? There have been some fairly specific uh, suggestions from the Pentagon to parliamentary delegations. And I'm wondering if, he, if he's thinking of echoing any of that. Well, I'm not going to get ahead of the discussions he might have. Ben uh, answered a question related to military spending and, and how we view that. We obviously think that the alliance has proven itself to be vital uh, for many years and uh, continues to be in the future and meeting the 
uh, challenges that we face uh, together. But uh, I don't have any more than the rather robust preview of the speech that Ben gave uh, to provide for you. Uh, John Christopher and I'll. Yeah. Earlier, Ben made a reference to a rising new world power or powers of interest or concerns, so to speak, that the US and UK alliance would be, uh, would, would he be alluding to China or what, what exactly? I don't, I don't remember the, the language he, he used. I think the- he, New world nations. Uh, right, I, I remember, I heard that part. I think he was, he was talking about the, uh, the durability and significance of this alliance, uh, even as the world has changed, obviously, with the rise of new powers uh, uh, around the globe. The necessarily threaten the, the alliance. No, I, he certainly didn't say that, and neither uh, would I. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jay.